Welcome to the South Pacific. Isn't it lovely? The white sand. Can you hear the splash of the tropical waters? The breeze in my hair. Ah. We have a real special treat for you. This won't be like our normal program. We always tell people it's not hard to learn how to sail. You can do it. You never. You don't have experience. No problem. Eh, a couple months. But to sail well, now that takes years. Yeah. A hard won experience. A lot of miles to really dial things in. It's not just about the boat. It's the sailors that make the boat go fast and keep the boat safe. We have a real special treat for you. Marcus Moser just won the 2022 O-Star race, east to west race. Solo. A solo. Yeah. Now the other gentleman, uh, some of you may be familiar with, a guy I have a lot of respect for, it's Shane Young. Channel by the name of Young Barnacles. So much valuable information. Shane's super experienced on the fast boats. An engineering genius too, so got a lot to learn today. Enjoy and we'll hopefully be back with you from a tropical place here real soon. Looking good, mate. Looking nice and tan. Yeah. <laughs> Something is wrong in my life. <laughs> Marcus, hi, nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time. No problem. So whereabouts are you? Currently hanging out in uh, Martinique um, in St. Anne. Ah, oh, red fly. Marcus, where are you? I'm in Switzerland. Marcus, Marcus Moser, recent winner of the All-Star. That's a single-handed race. So you're out there by yourself. Yeah. That, uh, I wouldn't do it right now again, to be honest. <laughs> I, I'm still fixing my boat. <laughs> oh, man. So that is, that's a grueling race. Can you just describe it? You guys go from east to west. You're going the wrong direction, you know. Yeah, we start in Plymouth, UK, and the finish line is in Newport, Rhode Island. And you are sailing against the low-pressure systems, which are all moving from west to east against the, the current which is also uh, going from uh, west to east. And um, so the air is five degrees or four degrees. The gusts are just uh, violent. They are also the waves. I mean, everything is a little bit more aggressive. A little bit? Uh, the yeah, the videos mean, tell the story. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's brutal, you know, because... Uh, yeah, I mean, off the day two, we were crossing a low pressure with 70 knots, cost, uh, 70 to 75, and it's banging. It's banging all the time. You know, half of the fleet was out after that low pressure. You, you have to, to survive that, you know, or not to enter. And if you want to be ranked in a race, you have to arrive. And that's at the end. That's the point of offshore racing. Tell me about how the boat held up. Tell me about uh, issues that, that came about. This boat is um, made for a kind of such trips. Obviously, if you do a trip like that, every mistake you do, will be you will be punished immediately. <laughs> so just to give you an example, what happens? Um, I have the chain locker. I put my fenders in the chain locker. As every normal, I mean, I don't need anchor, everybody would do that. What happened is, was that because of the slamming all the time, the, the ropes were on the, on, on the fenders were blocking the outlets, the water outlets of the chain locker. The chain locker was filling up. And one morning I put my feet on the floor, there was water, you know. So there was a little tiny cable connection, a through bulkhead connection, which was not which was not 100% waterproof. And what happens was I had some 800 or one ton of water in the boat. For every problem, I not I never react immediately, never. I always and you know, one mistake in front there, you are dead. The autopilot is driving. If you follow a board, no matter if you wear a lifeline or not, you are. That's my setup. Then you are dead. So um, um, if I recognize a problem which is somehow that could be dangerous, then I normally wait. I mean, doesn't matter what happens with the boat. I wait until 
the environment is in a state which allows me without risking my life to investigate in that stuff, you know. Just a little water in the chain locker was not the end of the troubles on this trip. No, no, no. Then uh, on a certain point, the bowsprit broke with the asymmetric up towards the sky. Then uh, obviously the furler is not working anymore. And this is quite a big sheet of sail. Um, and also then, I mean, it was 20, 22 knots of wind, so it was not a catastrophe, you know. The sail was flapping. Even there, I was thinking at least three hours what could be a possible solution. Because I have some experiences, asymmetrics and problems with asymmetrics. I don't know how many I lost of them already, because this sail is kind of over the limit for single-handed, just because of the size. So I decided then not to do any experiments and try to furl it in and hanging out at the bow there and do dangerous stuff. Um, so the final decision was to cut the asymmetric away. And then it took me another three quarters of an hour to really think in which, what, what I have, which line I have to cut when to not produce a disaster, you know, because when these things go, then when this sail goes underneath the boat or into the rudders, you know, but the, 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 the most important aim is always not to make out of a small disaster, a big disaster. And um, finally, I cut it away, including the case at furlough unit, which Ooh. is, uh, well, yeah. <sighs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it's money. I mean, it, on one hand, it's money or a lost sale. On the other hand, it's a lost life or a bigger trouble. I mean, it, it, the decision is quite easy, especially when you're alone. Yes. Well, now I'm just insanely curious because I'm imagining the same situation. Do we go sheet, hired, tack? Or we, do we go tack, hired, sheet? I'm thinking tack halyard sheet for the cutaway. What was the eventual? I was doing sheet. Then he flapped out. He was uh, flying out 90 degrees. Then I did tack line. Then the whole fernal unit, the whole thing was horizontal, more or less. And last, I did uh, the halyard. So I would have been completely and backwards. Don't forget the, the, the other sheet, you know, on the other side, you also have... Oh, the really, lazy sheet. Oh, of course. Yeah, you, you, you really have to, you have to check all your sheets. You have to think, uh, you have really, you, you walk around on your boat and do try to do a, a precise list in which, uh, w w when you do what, you know. Yeah. What was the what was the result as you went through the the procedure? Did it uh, did it fly away harmlessly to yeah. Lee or perfect? Did it, uh... I was totally satisfied wow, well to done. say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was working. No, yeah, I was somehow proud because it was working the way I was expecting. Well done. So keeping your cool, and that immediately yeah. makes me think of Shane and the video I watched of you. Well, eventually finding that you're minus a rudder, but your demeanor was so, well, I'm going to get a GoPro and let's take a look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and, and, you know, I guess like Marcus, when, when you do enough offshore sailing, uh, one of the things you learn very quickly is how to deal with disasters because, you come across a lot of them. They, they vary in severity from me losing a rudder to Marcus filling up his boat with water and, and some other ones that I'm sure he'll tell us about shortly to, yeah, you know, we've, we, I've been in situations where we're thinking about putting the life raft in the water. And the number one rule, like Marcus says, is you got to stop and not react. you got to stop and you got to think, is this an immediate problem? If it's not an immediate problem and it's not going to kill me, then we've got some time to think about it. Then it's, you know, going through the processes of, okay, I'm still going in a straight line. Nobody's dead. Um, everything's still good. Now, 
what do I need to do to continue making my boat safe? And where do I put my boat to continue making it safe? Because there's a lot of multiple scenarios happening here and a lot of inputs where it's not just the boat, but it's the people and it's also the weather and slowly just tick them off the list. What's going to keep me safe? What's going to keep the boat safe? And what's going to get me to the destination I'm, I'm going to? And like Marcus said, at this, he saw 70 knots coming. He ain't going to get to the other end. He ain't going to get to his destination. And he knows his boat. And I can't stress enough to people knowing your boat's the important part. But if he goes into 70 knots, he's going to be part of that 50% of the fleet that turns around and comes home. Yeah. So yeah. by just keeping your head screwed on, yeah, it's, it's, it's crucial. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we see a lot of youtube type of stuff where people get a little bit flustered in a flap and... <laughs> I'm absolutely going to reference your video in the description of this video, because uh, when you lost the rudder and looked at the weather, to decide what a, what relative wind you really could handle with less uh, directional control and how you were going to balance your sail plan. It is uh, it is an excellent lesson in dealing with something like losing a rudder on a cat. And because you guys have so much depth of experience with racing, one thing that I grew up racing, and one thing I've always been impressed with is how the technical evolution starts with the race boats and then seems to flow into the cruising yachts as well. I mean, just to look at the cruising monohulls now, I mean, to look at the sterns, I mean, that comes directly from these round-the-world boats. That yeah. was and, came from the Volvo 70s at the end of the day. Yeah. So and like the uh, and, uh, electronics, the software you use. I mean, it's no way to sail without the routing software, which is capable to, uh, to guide you offshore. Yeah. yeah is exactly. it something which is not yet arrived really at the cruisers, but that will for sure. Yeah, and that's something that um, you'll possibly see me focus a little bit more in future vids. I've got all this uh, gadgetry to record. Data recording is, you know, a bit of my gig. And right now, like literally just before we started, I've, I've gone through uh, three or four records of passages looking at something as simple as the rudder angle indicator as to whether there's too much main sheet on, too much mainsail up, you know, all of that sort of instrumentation that's not in the cruising world and not utilized by the cruising world so much because we keep getting told, ah, ah no, that's a race boat. I think we don't need that. So, <laughs> uh, actually, you might want to use that. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we're definitely paying much more attention to. For 46, the last boat, it was looking over the shoulder. Are we sliding? Are, are we trimmed up the way we should be? You know, looking at our rudder angle is pretty much... It was very rough with the Raymarine stuff we were looking at. As the boats get faster, um, these sorts of small things make a bigger difference. <laughs> um, so trimming 20 mil, 50 mil on your mainsail on a boat that's doing eight, nine knots makes a big difference compared to a boat that weighs 25 tonnes and does three knots. You can let that, you can let the main sheet in and out half a metre and it's still going to do three knots. You know, it's, it's the difference between driving a Volkswagen Beetle and a Porsche 911, you know. They're the same cousins. Having a decent clutch and uh, shift selector in your Porsche 911 matters. If you have that clutch and shift selector in your Volkswagen Beetle, <laughs> you know, it's still a Beetle, <laughs> you know. So how much percent of my Polos am I driving, you know? And if... If there was a 72, it was a total clear signal, I'm too slow. And you know, and if I didn't have that, I never would go out and adjust something on the sails or change from J2 to J1. But with this shitty percentage display, that this is making you go out and change something and to get up again to 89 or whatever, or 87 or 92%. And, and that's, that's the, that was the stress. Yeah. 
It's a it's a topic that uh, Shane, maybe you and I have spoken about this before, but it's the lack of polars that have been developed or documented for yeah. most cruising boats. It's it's seen, I think, as non essential, but could be so helpful. It's, yeah, it's it, it, yeah, like like you say, it's seen as non essential, but it's it's so essential, particularly now that weather routing's got so good and. And like Marcus is saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you're cruising or you're racing, you've still got to get from point A to point B. And if you are cruising, you are actually racing because you are racing weather systems. You're racing the weather system to either A, stay in it, or B, not get smacked by something behind or fall out of it. You know, there's, so you are in a way always racing, particularly on long ones like cross Atlantics and you've got, lows like entire lows and in marcus's case you know 70 knot lows uh, in, in our case uh, i took a gunboat back the other way from uh, the caribbean back to france not so long ago and we had to beat a low that was coming out of the u.s and smacked another gunboat that was behind us because they didn't quite get it right um so we stayed out of it we had other issues where we hit things and broke things but so you are racing uh you both have many more performance miles than I do, but I am a meteorologist and I do understand the, the importance, the significance of being able to quote unquote, outrun the weather. And in the back of my mind, I've always had this question and has been asked of me a few times is what sort of performance level do you need, practically speaking, to in the mid latitudes, stay out of trouble. Is it a 240 mile day? Is it a 180 mile day? Is it a 300 mile day? Obviously the more you have in terms of speed, the more options you have, but where is that minimum practically speaking? Practically speaking, it's a case of outrunning a system to outrun it and clear it you're a 300 mile day, 300 mile day boat, right? To, to outrun it. We talk about outrunning it being 150 mile uh, a day boat. You can outrun it to minimize it. So instead of getting whacked by 70 knots, you get whacked by 25 knots. Get south. And that's a get north. massive, massive difference. You know, you can get outside of the quadrant of danger that's that's the big important thing and we have uh, a very recent example of a, another boat that um was totally relying on uh, the polars of his cat sailed it into the atlantic thought that he could stay on the front of this big low and got swallowed by the low instead of you know running away from the quadrant of danger he thought I'll sit on the front of it because my polars can say I can do this. Thought he could sail at 100% polars and got smacked. Uh, so, yes, you can still have, you know, it was a 250-mile-day boat, um, so potentially could outrun this thing. But like Marcus was saying before, trying to sit at 90% of your polars, well, one, is your polars correct? Trying to sit at 90% of your polars is hard work. Um and if one of those two things doesn't come together, all of a sudden you're going to get swallowed by something that's more, well, what's a low, usual low come across the Atlantic at 45, 50 knots, uh, depending Thanks, yeah. on, yeah. So, you know, it's going to catch you, but what you do to run away from it means that you can sail north, south, whichever direction it's not going and minimize the impact. That's, that's outrunning a storm. I have, uh, well said, by the way, I have two follow-up questions that um, for, for either one of you. Um, can you give us a, a very basic description and how they're developed? Are they developed first in the design phase or is this something that we really have to go test first? Uh, yeah. I, I would show, I just, there are polars, which you normally get polars with your boat. When you buy a boat. In, the, the in, theoretical uh, ones. Yeah. The theoretical ones. And just be totally clear. 
these polars are not right. <laughs> totally wrong. My polars have been totally wrong. I was complaining. Then they calculated again, a little different, still wrong. <laughs> but the only way to get polars which are okay for you is to do tests. So I took that one and then I was driving thousands of miles and was always checking what is the boat doing compared to the polars. And then I was adjusting. I mean, they are not super precise still, but I'm always sailing between 90 and 105%. So for me, it's fine, you know? But these polars has, have nothing to do with the ones I get at the beginning. Now it's your turn. <laughs> yeah. Very well. So it, it's kind of cool. Like, like, So what Marcus was saying, there is two polars. There's a theoretical polar that as a designer, you spit out in flat water, perfect conditions. Um, this is what your boat could at its absolute maximum do. And this is what all the design parameters are, are based around. And this gives you an idea. All right. So that's the theoretical polar. Um, people take that as gospel and say, that's my boat. That's what I'm going to sail to. And that's what got this guy in this big cap that I talked about before got him in trouble. He was using a theoretical polar where I've spent a lot of time messing around in the last uh, year and a half is in building actual polars and in race teams, it's a big thing, particularly with Bondi boat guys, they spend a lot of time building their own polars and they got stuff that I don't have the, the budget for, but it's really cool. Um, I've found some really cool uh, tools through little bits taken out of open CPN uh, with my salmon displays and things. So I collect all this data that my boat gives me and I run it through certain bits of software to then build the polars as I'm sailing. And it takes ages because when you're building the polars, you're never sailing upwind at 25 knots when you want to be in a certain situation to record and all the rest of it. So it takes a long time to get this large spread of sailing conditions to record and get all your data from. Uh, have a performance top end uh, to target for, or in particularly in the performance cruising world sort of thing. These are real numbers that you can sail to all day, every day. And when you plug it in to do a route, the when you get to the other end, um, you're within five, ten percent of arrival times, um, and this is where a lot of develop needs development needs to be done. Um, and it's been a lot of big conversations with myself and other people. And um, if you know any good app, app developers out there, we're <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Look at reach out to any of us. <laughs> and it's, I mean, to be honest, it's a huge uh, this weather routing. You know, this is also a, a safety issue for yeah. me. To have accurate polars, which means I have an accurate weather routing, which means I can avoid the worst or I can deal with the low pressures or the high pressures or whatever. This yeah. is a quite huge and underestimated safety issue. 110%. Yeah. We, yeah. You, you know, you, you say, well, Marcus and I have obviously both had the same experiences where we both had our teeth kicked in because the routing's let us down where we've put ourselves in positions because we thought we'd be somewhere by a certain time and you've either a missed it or b you've well and truly got it um and yeah it, it's 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 so so important and particularly where it's it's not it's not as critical you know going between the islands here in caribbean where it's 40 miles and you do a route and you're out by you know 50 percent you know looking in our boat that, that you, we're, we're talking you know two hours <laughs> less than yeah, <laughs> yeah Whereas, I, I... I know but it's so important to know how hard you push because you're just going off hearsay you talk to an owner and he's like well katana told me that i could push full sail to 25 knots and you're like well push your push full sail to 25 knots what are we talking about one five zero or or zero nine zero like it's not the same thing yeah um, it, 
and it's actually it's, it's another really good sort of topic in understanding is is, is people <clears throat> understanding the difference between apparent wind and true wind. The, the the apparent wind angle here, which is the red one, hasn't changed much between when it was what was it 14 knots before. Yeah. But you can see the true wind angle. We were sitting at 44, 45 degrees true, but we've now dropped to 53. And it's not because the boat's going sideways or anything. It's actually because the boat's going fast. The faster the boat goes, the more it drags the apparent wind around. So we don't actually, the boat's not going any lower as such, whereas we're restricted by our sheeting angles so that we can only sail at, oh, that was a good one. So we're restricted by our sheeting angles, which limits our apparent wind angle here. And you can see here, there's our jib car. And we're right in on our max trim in on our jib car, which looks about five degrees by my iometer. <laughs> um, so this becomes actually the limiting factor to how high you can sail. You know, that simple thing is, is, is it's a subject that um, people actually don't understand. I'm, I'm, it sort of takes me aback a little bit when I first came across it that people didn't understand the difference between the two and how important they are because your true wind is, is uh, really important because you know that that's, that's the situation you're in. You know, you're in 30 knots of wind. But it's your apparent wind that's really important to what's happening on your boat because if you've got 30 knots, you be sailing upwind in 30 knots and you've got 50 knots going over the deck and 50 knots going through the sail and 50 knots of sail loads to deal with. But if you're in 30 knots of wind and you're going downwind and you've only got 20 knots of uh, apparent wind, you know, all of a sudden you, you can have big bags up and things like that. So the understanding of uh, the difference between apparent and, 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 and yeah. uh, true wind is... It's mind-boggling that people don't understand it and the, the repercussions of it in their boat. You are right. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's really it, it's a matter of fact that many people they have no clue what's the difference is. Yeah. Well, I I always explain it like this: is the true wind is what the ocean feels, and the apparent wind is what the boat feels, and it's exactly. a combination of the two that leads to the choices you make on which which heading you want to take. You know, what are you going to subject the boat to? And then what's your comfort level? What can you handle? Marcus, your, your standards are a little different than most of ours. But, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a major consideration. Uh, one thing that I've been delving into, I did this with Annie Gardner and Eric Witte, is understanding the danger zone on a reach and knowing what our escape route is. Because there is a limit where bearing away actually could be a problem. Um, so you get to relative wind that's that's really pushing the boat and okay are we going to bear away or are we going to head up and try and depower and uh it's not a situation you know in gusty conditions that's where you better know ahead of time but uh you know as it's coming up over a couple hours you can kind of decide yeah i mean yeah. In, in, in this in these terms i mean the safest course from my point of view is upwind because upwind is five degrees and you have deep power to sails you know i mean upwind you are all upwind is always you have always a, a quick way out 90 degrees for me is 92 90 degrees to uh, twa is the is the worst thing because of the waves and because yeah. Before something happened, which has an effect on your boat, you have to bear away or to to go up for at least thirty degrees. You know. Yeah, and it, it, in in big multi hulls, big fast multi hulls, this is a massive subject. And every shift change that you do, the first piece of information you give the guy that's on the stick is where's your out, up or down. You know, that's the first piece of information. Up is out, or down is out. Um, that's it, it is a crucial thing and that's the first thing that's that's relayed in a shift crossover because when you're in a boat that's doing two times wind speed you're sailing upwind all the time uh, yeah. and it's it's a really weird sort of scenario to be in but and, and this is uh, a term that you may have heard it's it's called the the danger zone or we call it death reaching sitting here with the finger on the trigger <laughs> a bit of death reaching 
Um, there is a no-go zone that you don't want to be in, particularly with fast multi hulls, and that's between 100 and 110 degrees. Because when you're in this zone, you're doomed no matter which way you go. Um, it's very, very difficult to get out of that situation. So we try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very critical. It's not as bad on our slower boats and yachts don't feel it too much. The worst case scenario with a keel boat. Um, and it was funny having a bunch of Omoka guys coming onto a big multi hull. Um, we're talking about, you know, the shift change over and I'll tell them, you know, up is out, down is out. And they're like, yep, yeah, that's cool. And it's funny you're so stressed about it because in the Amoka, you know, we have it. But the worst case scenario is we fall over. I said, yeah, but we don't want to fall over in this thing, you know, 70 foot cat upside down. It ain't coming back upright. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Death reaching. I had not heard that term before. In your typical performance cruising cat, I'm talking about an Uchermer 51, a Katana 471. Um, can you describe the conditions or the true wind that we might be looking at where that uh, that one, you say 110 to 120 or 100? 100 to 110 uh, is, is the, in, in the fast multis. Um, with the slightly slower ones, like mine and the Uchermers and, and the things, it is around, it's between 90 and uh, 105. Um, it, it, you start getting unsettled and nervous because if you bear away, you're still powering up enough to bury your nose and you're still being reached enough that if you round up, you can still power up because you still, the apparent, it's more about the, where the apparent wind is mm -hmm. and whether you can blanket um, the sail in the bear away and not bury the nose or whether you can round up and not power up the sails as you're going through the roundup. So that's the two differences is how your apparent wind is in relation to the true wind and how far you've dragged that apparent round in getting through this eye of doom. Um, and if your boat can accelerate quickly and easily, that, open, you know, it, it makes the, the bear aways easier. Um, so the 68s, so the gunboat 68s are fantastic. They've got this really great ability to bear away, power it up. Um, so the, the get out of jail manoeuvre generally uh, is is down um, in that 90 degree zone. Uh, whereas in the uh, Orma 60, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it gets a lot greyer. It depends on whether you're on a wave or not on a wave. Uh, it depends on who's on the trim and can react to you. There's so many other little variables in there um, and how much board you have deployed in the hull. Oh, okay. It's just, it's that cause the, uh, is that because the gunboat has more buoyancy forward and won't tumble or? Yeah, like um, I'll give the gunboat designers some massive kudos what they did with designing the bows and the weights of the boat. So it's quite a heavy multi-hull for a performance multi-hull um as you know they're light but they're still heavy um and yes they have some fantastic traits in that there's some great reserve buoyancy and the boat tends to squat when it's at speed and this also helps to um keep the bum down and the bows up which is a fantastic trait when you're pushing hard and you're in bad situations so the, the, the natural reaction of the platform of the 68 is phenomenal in that you can get away with a lot of stuff. Um, and we've um, tested a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, ever any uh, interest or possibility of going to the multi-hole for cruising or racing? Um, difficult question. So I was sailing years ago on a Lagoon 42. We tried to hoist the sail. It was not working. I think I was the first one who was trying this sail since years. So, um, no, I haven't really um, the chance to do that. Uh, probably I will sail one day with uh, Shane and his uh, catamaran. Um, what I can say for me, the fearing thing about multi-hole 
is that you always have to think about load. And, you know, I mean, the monohull is depowering by leaning over. So uh, that's for me quite logical. And I'm, I'm coming from the dinghy. I, I was learning sailing on dinghy. So I have a quite good feeling for loads. And what I see on multi holes and on mono holes, if you see broken musts, mostly it has to do with over, overpowering. And that has to do with not have a feeling for the loads. Mm-hmm. And yeah, in, in, in multi holes for me, this is really, I have to, yeah, it's really difficult. You always have to have an eye on the wind speed, I assume, and yep. your sail plan. And you, you, because nothing happens. Yeah. I mean, this is another huge topic. Guys, I could just keep talking to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, yeah. And just to, to expand on your point, Marcus, almost every, multi, every cat that we see is way overloaded. We uh. have struggled always to remove the weight. And it just, it just, comes on like after christmas you know and and uh and And why is that why is that why are they overpowered they're Uh, overloaded because overloaded toys yes the toys are just too enticing they're apartments you know (laughs) yeah it's so easy to one they're super sensitive to the weight so if you put half a ton on your boat marcus yeah and also happens it's like ah I got half a ton on, and it, it, there's this actually funny thing with with a mono hull is it, it'll actually sometimes get a little bit faster because you've added to its riding moment a little bit, which is giving it some stiffness and it'll go faster until you get too much on and it starts slowing down. Whereas in the multi hull, you put the weight on, and the weight instantly goes into writing moment because it's a mechanical coupling between weight and the beam of the boat, and the, yeah. the two components of that writing moment coupling. So the weight goes in the riding moment goes up but the biggest issue with a multi-hull is because we got skinny hulls we sink very quickly which then increases the um the resistance so the boat slows down very quickly so then the load goes up again because the yeah. boat's not easy to drive. If, yeah if the resistance rises yeah everything yeah. Mm-hmm. so may i ask you something nick yes um when you sailing with your uh, catamaran Mm-hmm. Um, you do also you choose also the sale plan by numbers or do you do that by feeling or experience or I don't know hmm. well it's a our last catamaran was a leopard 46 and yeah. uh, it's, it's a very forgiving boat and the polars supplied I think were actually for the wrong boat or they were so bad that I just could not even I couldn't even look at them with any sort of value. So it became uh, much more of, of a feeling. And like I said, in the beginning, looking over my shoulder, uh, the, I do believe that there is a sensitivity that you can develop and actually you can feel them. Uh, it takes a long time compared to monoholes. We've had four mon- uh, three monoholes previously. It takes a long time with the catamaran to feel it and to understand it. And it's much more sensitive than I, than I would have uh, thought. So uh, for us, so far, it has been in feeling, with, and we're very conservative. But with our interests in a performance multi-hole, I understand the sensitivity is much more, uh, there's just, it's much more sensitive. Everything's more sensitive, and that's why I'm asking and talking and sailing with performance sailors to to hopefully understand um so yeah it's it's been mostly feeling but i understand that there's limitations on that yeah, i it. think you need to reach out for load cells load meters that's probably i, I would I, if i yeah if i my boat would be a little bit more performant i would install a load a load cell you know just to measure to have a clear data and then you just, uh, yeah, you know where you are, you know. I think yeah. the market is there because, uh, yeah, I, I'm not alone in my interest in moving from the charter catamaran to something mm. more fun and better performing. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting point you bring up, Mark. It's the load cell thing because um, this is something that we've used in the race boats a lot. 
um, and having stepped out of the race boat and into the bigger performance multi-hull scene, a lot of them don't have it. Um, and over the last sort of three or four years, they've become more and more prevalent. Like gumbo has them as standard now, um, thank goodness, because it is as important as important as the wind meter on top of the mast and the log in the water. It wow. is the number one dial that you look at all the time. Wow. It is also um, integrated into the upside up capsize system. So super, super important. Uh, I can't stress enough how important this gauge is, particularly on the bigger ones, uh, because like Marcus said, you can't feel it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, even though, even us with, you know, many, many, many years of sailing behind us, you get in the, the 68s and it's like, this is a lounge chair, man, that goes fast. <laughs> um, and the load creeps up on you so quickly and so easily. It's, it's amazing how fast. And all I can say is, thank goodness we've got the load cells there and they're connected to alarms. Um, I've got a video clip somewhere actually uh, that I'll send you of me sailing the 68 through the Straits to Gibraltar. And all you can hear is the load cell alarms going off. Um, I've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's buzzing and being, and it's super critical. Um, and that was, I can't, I can't stress it enough. In, in, you know, I think it's going to be something that gets developed, like we are talking before with Marcus, the instrumentation and electronics and so, inside of boats. This is going to become uh, a day-to-day standard thing yeah. in the smaller boats uh, because... If not even the insurance company is asking for that. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not even expensive anymore. No. Oh, really? No. no, it's 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 reasonable. <laughs> in terms in, in both dollars, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I mean, yeah. all this all this stuff transfers because exactly what Shane was saying about loading. I mean, we had a charter cat and you fill the water tanks and you drop the bows five inches. I'm not exaggerating. You drop the bows yeah. five inches with full water tanks. So yeah, all the same principles, the physics are the same. It's just much more sensitive with these performance boats. Oh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, yeah, with the, I really like what Predict Wind has been doing and seeing the importance of integrating better polar information into their routing, into their models. Uh, do you guys know of any competing services, anybody who's ahead of the game or ahead of where Predict Wind is? Uh, so I, a, yeah, sorry, go ahead. There, there's a lot of competing uh, people in this space, um, but it's a little bit, um, how would you say, very segregated. So, you you know, as a meteorologist, Nick, you know, you can get your weather models from Predict Wind, Squid, uh, what's the American ones? I can never remember their names. Uh, there's Noah and you know, all, the, all of these places oh, wow. where you can, Yep, get your models from. It's the same um, models, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. Your GFS, your EMCWS, and uh, all of these models. Yeah, they're all the same models that these PIP services provide. You know, there's the likes of Predict Win that do their own spins on it for localized, uh, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But that's one part of the equation. That's, that's the weather component coming in. Then there's the actual routing component. And now this space is pretty competitive and pretty active. So you've got um, Predict Win with their routing uh, algorithms providing routes. You've got Arduino, which is a French um, routing and navigation software. You've got Expedition, which is um, yeah. developed from memory. Yeah. I'm probably getting it more. Um, and there is the likes of the smaller players of the QTVLMs and the open CPNs and a few other sort of sources. But, you know, they were sort of the, the bigger, more common ones. Those markets are, are pretty hot. Um, and one of the really cool things, and I've got to give kudos to, to predict when they actually bought all, of, they bought Arduino, they bought uh, Expedition, they also bought 
two or three other routing software things because they wanted to uh, see how their how they could improve their um, routing because they were having issues with land avoidance um, and uh, shortest fastest routes and things like that and they changed their logarithms and uh, it's a very cool article to go and find on predict when how their new logarithms compare with these very expensive uh, expeditions cool. and arenas and how they work. Uh, very impressive. Um, it's very for, cool. But uh, gentlemen, please correct my very rudimentary description here or explanation of what exactly polars are. So for any particular boat design and given its loading, typical or actual on the day of, the boat will perform in, in terms of forward speed, we're not talking about BMG, forward speed uh, at a particular rate for any given point of sail and wind speed. And it will vary greatly depending on how many holes you've got, how much wetted surface you've got, the shape of the holes. Is that a pretty de good description of what a polar diagram or polars can help describe in terms of boat performance? Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. Well, yeah, it's it's basically a target speed for any given sailing angle that you're at in a given wind speed. It's, it's so when Marcus great. is referencing being at seventy percent of his polars or ninety to a hundred, wow, uh, what you're talking about is the percentage of the maybe theoretical or maybe actual speed that the boat is capable of in those conditions. Correct. Yeah. And as a bit of an example, say we're beam reaching 90 degrees to the true wind in 10 knots of wind, the polar speed would be, uh, let's say eight knots is our target speed. Um, and you'd be, if you are doing eight knots of boat speed, you would be achieving 100% of your polar speed. That's what we're looking for. But as a lot of us know, um, our pole is a generally pretty uh, optimistic. So right. to, to hit those numbers is, is quite difficult. Yeah, it's also a sales thing, you know. Polars is good for selling and you everybody yeah. wants to have a false boat and the polars, if you look at that diagram, you say, wow, wow, look at that with 15 knots of wind, this thing is driving nine knots. And I mean, you know, I mean, the point is on 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 custom made polars. It's not a wow. It's just a reality. So if I reach one hundred percent of my polars, it's not a it's not a wow effect. It's it's just what I what what I expect to reach as single handed. I mean, a boat which is uh, sailed single handed is not as fast as one with 10 person 10 crew on it you know so uh, therefore it's and and for me it's it's important that the polars are realistic because of the weather routing and because of the frustration potential you know because if you're always sneaking around at 40 percent of your polars you're thinking you, you start thinking you are sick you know something is wrong totally with you yeah, 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 hundred percent, and and it's also important. Um, this is where I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to push people down. In Marcus's case, he's in a sailing yacht, and he gets a little bit limited by hull speed with his boat. Uh, and when you're doing polars for yachts, yacht polars are a little bit easier to develop, and the theoretical polars for yachts are easier to develop because the the rules behind a, a yacht are uh, very well defined and fairly easy to manage. Where polars actually get really tricky is when you start getting into the performance moldy hulls. Um, you can have very big spikes in your polars, uh, particularly if you look in that 90 to 120 degree uh, true wind angle range, you'll see we don't get stuck into, in the hull speed regime particularly if the boat's light. What does tend to happen, what's really important where I'd love to sort of make polar building a lot easier is that, okay, I've got my boat, it's performance orientated and it's lighter. But if I'm doing an Atlantic crossing, 
I've got to take uh, 15 to 19, 15 to 20 days worth of food. So all of a sudden, the boat just got a lot heavier. Um, I'm taking a few other bits and pieces um, or, you know, I change my boat trim by taking extra gear. So all of a sudden, the polars that I made while I was um, in the lightweight condition uh, changes. So now my boat's heavier. In Marcus's case, the polar doesn't change dramatically and you can just change it by, say, 10%. In the multi holes case, it changes massively. Like, we're not talking little amounts. We're talking big amounts um, by putting extra weight in there. And this is where it's actually important to start looking at having two sets of polars, you know, your lightweight coastal cruising polar and the I've got a lot of supplies on for a really long passage uh, polars. Likewise, with all the polars I'm building, uh, I build my polars with sail configurations. So I have polars with full main, full jib. I have polars with full main, uh, sorry, first reef, full jib. I have polars with second reef, full jib. I have polars full main and uh, masthead spinnaker. So that if I lose a sail, like Marcus had in when he was racing, I've got another set of polars I can work from because my boat's been compromised. And these sorts of things all of a sudden become, okay, that polar is no longer available to me here's my new set of polars and this is what I'm working to. And I'm going to be in, you know, in Marcus's case, I'd be pushing 90%, but 90% without the asymmetric spinnaker. So it's, uh, yeah, there's polars, there's polars and there's polars, you know, there's, it's a, it's a pretty big beast. Thank you, thank you, Shane. You made, you give me the job for the next three years. <laughs> <laughs> How to, to develop different sets of polars. You made my day. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. But, It, it, it's, it's interesting, like, uh, Marcus probably hasn't got the same sort of little gadgets I've got for pr producing my polars at the moment. So his, his, uh, his method is probably what mine was when I first got the boat. It was very manual, very slow, and you're getting in there and you're manually doing it. Mine's semi-automated now, uh, where I'm getting my NMEA data in. It's coming into a uh, collecting uh, filter, and it's automatically building the, um, the polar table as I'm sailing live, it's pretty cool to watch. Um, and then that happens. And then once that's happened, I'll then go and clean that a little bit more because you, you get some anomalies, particularly if you're catching waves and things like that. And that's actually really cool uh, point that when you're collecting real time data, when you're in 20 knots, you're nearly always going to have waves unless you're behind islands and things like that. So it was really fun. Uh, I was sailing behind Martinique the other week and we had 15 knots and it was flat. And I'm like, man, my polars are looking <laughs> awesome compared to my standards. And it's my standard polar that I'm going to have to readjust. And I thought, like, no, actually, I'm behind that island and flat waters here. And we're, we're talking like 30% differences. So mm -hmm. um, it was it was quite substantial. Um, Well, uh, it's a, what a fantastic conversation, gentlemen. Uh, I, I see Shane, why they're trusting you with these big gunboats and such. Uh, yeah. As you head into the performance category, you really have to know your boat a lot better than your old lagoon or leopard or whatever set enough canvas. So she doesn't tip over and you'll probably be just fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things that'll bite you on bigger performance boats. <laughs> So to move the conversation along, maybe into a new category, um, it, it's my feeling or my intuition that a lot of the uh, setup and rigging choices that you make uh, for short handed sailing translate well into, well, your typical cruising scenario, which is husband and wife, husband and husband, wife and wife, which is in essence, single-handed most of the time, save the sleep deprivation. <laughs> Could uh, either or both of you talk about some of the choices you've made on your boats to make them easier to handle, but still perform very well? Um, Marcus can uh, do this because he knows how much I, 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 I hammer into his ears about the setup for his boat, because uh, that's how I actually originally met Marcus, was um, exactly. helping him set up uh, his first boat for the O-Star. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, the first uh, sentence uh, Shane was uh, telling me was, you need to avoid to left the cockpit. 
That's rule number one. Stay behind and everything what you can do from behind, you have to do from behind. And that's the golden rule of the setup of easy and safe shorthand sailing. And that's a path we are still walking on. And it's even better. So the, the, the out cockpit time is as, uh, as minimal as possible, you know. That's rule number one. And from my point of view, the most important rule. Yeah. So that's, that means, of course, getting all of your reefing. Well, everything, but your everything. reefing. Even uh, furling line. I have all my, my asymmetric furling line leads to the cockpit. Um, I'm not, I mean, I barely get out of the cockpit. Literally everything. I mean, okay, the, the, the whole yards of the J1 and J2, which are permanent rigged, they are on the must. Yeah, and as Marcus said, it's, it's rule number one. Stay in the safe place. And where's the safest place? That's the cockpit, not the bow. It's, 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 it's quite simple. The only small modification to that, and we set it up on uh, his Lou 45, is... This, the halyards for spinnakers and when you're raising a particular sail in front of the mast, you don't want to run from the mast to the cockpit and back in order to pull that sail up. To deploy the sail, so to unfurl it and furl it uh, and sheet it on, that's done in the cockpit. But to get it into the sky, you want to do everything from wherever you're deploy. If you If you can deploy a sail from the cockpit, you have the halyards and the tack lines in the cockpit. <laughs> Generally speaking, if you have a spinnaker or a code zero and you're hoisting, you're hoisting it on the bow. So where do you want to be? You don't want to be running from the bow where you've just opened the bag for your sail to come out of the bag. You run back to the cockpit and a wave has all of a sudden got your spinnaker and dragged it off the deck. Um, so we did set up things like his um, stay sails and how he's for his spinnakers on the loop 45 on the deck where he did all his deck four deck work on the four deck and all his halyards and everything were there but once it was in the sky all the handling was then done in the cockpit so you got to think about what sail, what you're doing with your sail and where you put the controls for that sail um, and we did the same sort of thing on our boat you know most people know I designed and built a, a new mast for our boat from a, an old America's Cup boat uh, mast, but that meant re-rigging everything, re-running control lines and where I put things um, and thinking about how we did things. So obviously everything done with the mainsail from the cockpit, everything done forward of the mast to initially hoist it is at the mast, but everything to control those sails is done from a copper. Um, and yeah, we, we set it up so that whenever we hoist uh, things, it's done at the base of the mast where it's safe. And being on a catamaran, it's a little bit safer. You've got a bit more room to manoeuvre. Um, in Marcus's case on his yacht, we had to even think about things like when he was hoisting, how he would be sitting on the deck, where he would be putting his feet on tow rails, on uh, cabin tops, what was what was what was his position going to be on the boat whilst he was operating that thing? Those sorts of things are critical. They're the small details, but they mean the difference between falling off and not falling off. Um, no. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> said. There's there's no one there to catch you. So no, it's you're very done. important. Yeah. Uh, maybe you will always end up there. It's no one there to to catch you. That's always, and this is also valid for for a couple sailing, you know, as you mentioned before. No, yeah. Normally, couple sailing is like single-hand sailing. Yes. And except and the, the dangers, that's also the dangerous thing about two-handed sailing, you know, that you yeah. think you're not alone, but in reality, you are alone. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Because whilst, that's, whilst someone's sleeping and you fall off, they don't hear you. You, 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 you got to be very, very lucky in that you made enough noise when you're falling off to wake them up. And nine times out of ten, they are so tired, you got you, you got to make a big noise falling off. Um, and even if so, they yes. are aware, it's like uh, the, the chance of being able to maneuver 
as close as you need to while maintaining contact, sure, uh, a personal beacon will help, but only maybe about flying sails and over trimming just a bit so that we don't curl the left. Yeah, yeah. So um, shorthanded sailing, you want to avoid loose luff sails. You know, Marcus has a has an affectionate uh, love for them. <laughs> he doesn't like them very much. I also have the same love hate relationship. I love them because I've done a lot of fully crewed sailing, and I know the potential of loose luff sails, uh, particularly if you're trying to run deep. They are fast. They are really fast, but they are so hard to handle. You've only got to have a flap go the wrong way, and one of two things will happen. You can flap a kite and it'll explode. We've had this recent experience and my 10-year-old um, took a lot of joy in telling me, Dad, I told you so. Uh, <laughs> or two, the other scenario that tends to happen when uh, you get a good flap on with, with a sail is the potential to wrap it around the forestay or whatever stays there. And we've all probably uh, been in the marina and seen someone come in with a spinnaker wrapped around a head stay or whatever it is. It's not a cool look. So the potential for disaster with loose slough sails is really, really high. Um, so we try to avoid them. And one of the cool things in the developments of boats, um, like Marcus's you know, boat is going faster. You've got the Amokas that are going faster. Apparent winds now are going forward. So these loose laugh sails are starting to become less necessary, uh, particularly in multi-hulls. Multi-hulls, to have a loose, you've, you've got, once upon a time, you'd have three or four spinnakers on board. Now you're lucky if you've got one. Um, now you look at an A3 or an A5 in a big multi-hull, and it looks like a big full headsail. It's got a big, full, tight furling cable. And it's super cool in that to deploy and um, uh, take the sail away, it's one line to uh, fill the thing and it's gone. Also, when you're wrestling, and it can stay up there for quite a bit, uh, which is cool. So you've filled it and you can have a 30, 40 knot squall roll over you with this thing still hanging up there. And it's not like a furled loose luff spinnaker where a leech can sort of pop out and then start self-deploy itself um these flatter uh, style uh four sails are completely changing the way we sort of look at and manage the boats um and it's really really cool and this comes back down to the performance boat categories we've all of a sudden got more options to sail our boats and we've got more options in what sails we can use with our boats because they go faster the apparents are further forward all of a sudden the sails get easier to use, easier to handle, easier to hoist because hoisting and retrieving a, a, a sail that's been a, now a furled sausage um, is much safer and easier to deal with than dealing with these loose slough sails. It's really a, it's a perspective changer for me. It's, it's confirmation to hear you say, you know, loose, loose slough sails are a gamble, especially on these higher performance boats. Uh, because snuffing, taking it around, switching the sheet is, you know, maybe not the performance sailor's first trick, but it does save you from a potential, well, losing, losing the chute completely or, you know, dragging it into a rudder or your prop, and then you've got a whole other mess. Uh, so that's confirmation for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I would say maybe I agree totally with Jane that this, uh, the, the, this let's say, the unwind sales are the potential risk and uh, difficult to handle and a little mistake can cause a big disaster and so on. Um, the, other thing, the other thing I think is mostly underestimated is that you also have to be aware that even a reefed sail has a good shape. A badly reefed mainsail, and that's what I see often, you know, with all these charter boats, and then if you look at their reefs, it's totally senseless, you know? So, I mean, you really need to pay attention that your smaller mainsail 
uh, does what it's supposed to do. And it, that means it has to reduce the load, the, the sale has uh, to survive, and for that it needs a perfect setup. And reefing is something you have to, I adjust in the meantime, thanks to you, Shane, I adjust my reefs in the marina, I put mark on it so that I'm able to put in a perfect second or third reef in the night in with heavy winds. And there, I have no doubt that my sail is maybe not 100% perfect, but let's say 90%. And then if the daylight comes back, I can adjust it. And the learning out of that is take also, you, you have to take care of that. And to, uh, to, to reach that point, that's maybe the next thing, which is, which is also, which falls also in the, in, into Shane's part is you need good ropes, good lines. You know, uh, if your reefing line is stretching like hell after two hours, um, your, 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 your reefed mainsail will look like a, like a, a bag, you know? Potatoes. Yeah. Potato bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, the thing I've noticed, and I'm strictly an amateur, is just how much foot tension will be put on uh, these reef clues. Uh, instead of the leads being down where they need to be or, or closer into the gooseneck, uh, they're stretching the foot just so bar tight, but not getting the downforce that they need to really stretch against the halyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a big thing. And it's not like reefing is a big problem across the board. It's difficult from the from the most expensive race boats you can think of. We have issues down to the, the guy in his little twenty foot uh, Sonata or whatever it is, and he's you know got a Dacron main from thirty years ago, and it's a sack potato. He's got the same issues. Reefing is difficult, uh, and this is why there's a trend towards masts moving back and mainsails getting smaller and headsails getting bigger, and you know just being able to get rid of the mainsail gets easier reefing is a big problem and it takes a lot of effort to get it right and as marcus said <clears throat> we can't stress how important it is to still maintain that sail shape and again like you said nick how important it is not to stretch the bajingas out of your mainsail at each reef point because if you've got second reef in there and you're pulling back on it like nobody's business when you come out of second reef back into first or full main, you've got this great big stretch mark where you've just been in second reef and, and destroyed your main. Uh, and all that beautiful sail shape you once had is now gone. So it's really important to adjust these things. And like Marcus said, you know, he, he, was, he was quite surprised when I said, we're going to whip and mark all your halyards and all your reefing lines. So that whenever you go and you put a reef in at two o'clock in the morning, when that mark comes out of the clutch, you know you're in the ballpark. You know you're there. Um, and, so that you can repeat that each time. And it doesn't matter whether you're racing or cruising. And, yeah. and just to add or clarify or ask the question, when you say you whip to mark, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, you're not talking about a, uh, uh, like a, uh, a pen. You're not using a marker. You're whipping yeah. the, the spot. Yeah, so to start with, I'll use a marker pen because, you know, covers, especially if it's a new rope, covers and cores, they, they stretch and slide around a bit. And it also takes two or three goes and putting a reef in and knowing what the nice shape is. And for people wanting to know, basically the depth of sag in the foot. So if you're looking at uh, the clue or where the reef is at the end of the boom to the mast, you should have about 1% of the length of that as sag in, in the sail, right? Um, you can calculate that, or basically you look at it and it's got a curve in it. It's not dead straight, okay? You want a, a slight curve in there that sort of matches the, the rest of the shape of the sail, a little bit flat. Um, so, yeah, you want to be marking your ropes to achieve this. And initially we mark the rope with a felt tip marker pen, permanent marker pen. And once we're happy that it's you've done it two or three times, five times, you then, yes, go and make a whipping uh, where you actually stitch a colour, a, a, a bright red or blue or green, whatever it is, into the rope uh, on your, say, your, your main halyard. And we'll actually stitch 
uh, a one one whipping for first reef, two whippings for second reef, three whippings for third reef, or we'll change the colours. Um, and for the actual reef lines as well, we'll put a whipping in there. Um, sometimes you do get continual uh, cover creep and things like that, so you'll sometimes get a cover that'll bunch where you put the whipping, so it may involve undoing the whipping sometimes. In the really big super yacht race boats, we do this thing called a fuzzy marker we will stitch through it a heap of times uh, and then cut the loops off so it's like a bit of shag pile carpet that's in the uh, in the halyard and that way the cover can still move on the core and doesn't get caught in clutches and things like that um, so there's man you better weight. you better really know what you're doing some of those big boats have five thousand dollar halyards <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and you're talking twenty to fifty grand a spinnaker, and yeah, if, if you miss a lock or something like that, it gets it becomes a very expensive afternoon. So, <laughs> Mark and oh. halyards is super important on those things. These are fantastic tips, guys. I don't want to keep you all day long. Are there any uh, quick top of mind performance tricks, hit hints, uh, tips that you can uh, share with us? Otherwise, we can wrap it up. Keep your boat light. It's, it's the, number one thing certainly multi-world i would i would really suggest to uh, start dealing with polars yeah not just to rely on your feelings you know i know so many people that say oh my boat is uh, i have such a fast boat and i say from where you know that i mean i could i cannot i mean yeah i can feel it in a way you think you are fast but you know numbers don't lie yeah yeah that's right i'd, I'd have to say actually um Number one rule on your boat, and it's, it involves sailing it well, uh, going fast and being safe. Know your boat. That is the number one rule. Know your boat and know it well. Know everything about your boat from how the anchor winch works to how the switches work to turn your anchor light on to the bearing systems in your rudders. Because when you run into a problem, if you don't know your boat, you don't know how to fix it and you don't know how to deal with the problem. So knowing your boat and how it works is the number one safety feature and the number one feature to get your boat safely from point A to point B. Fantastic. Gentlemen, uh, you only get to know your boats by uh, getting out there and doing it and having the experiences. Thank you so much for spending all this time with us and, and uh, teaching us about uh, what we can do to sail better, safer, faster. You kind of rolled all into one ball. So thank you so much. If you'd like to get more in-depth information on all these topics, I uh, urge you to subscribe to the Young Barnacles channel where Shane Young will share a lot of his deep insight and information on these topics. And Marcus, it, Marcus Mosher, if you want to check out his channel on YouTube, if you want to see some raw, difficult sailing, cheers to you, mate. I could not handle that even for an hour. Thank you for having us. Oh, thanks, guys, so much. Yeah, it's great to talk, and I uh, hope we get to talk again soon. I hope so.